Welcome to episode four of Through the Pages, my book review show. Much like last month, this month features books that are a little more political, a little more socially poignant um, with everything going on in the world these days. I am wanting to learn more and become better able to approach and discuss these issues facing our world. So while most of them are related to that, this first one was a little more self-serving and it is all about gut health. Um, I've been waiting for this book for a while to come out and then it came out last month and I was just, I wanted to stay more focused on like race relations and politics. So I skipped it. Um, but yeah, this was the first one I read this month and it was super good. Um, so you may know this author, um, Will Boo starts with a B, goes by Dr. B in the book, but also would be known as the gut health MD on social media. Um, I've posted a lot of his stuff, um, continually just loving every everything that he puts out his last one that i reposted that was all about soy was really good um and so this book it walks the line perfectly of being enjoyable for someone who's already a gut health enthusiast or just into probiotics and you know doesn't necessarily need you know fermented foods 101 but is also still easy to loan out and easy to absorb for anyone. So you don't have to have a base of knowledge, but if you already have a base, there's also stuff to build on on there. There's a whole long section on short chain fatty acids and it's like, wow, thank you. So I was really happy with this book, just everything about it, like, I don't know, it fulfilled all my expectations. And it's hard to do for science books, in my opinion. Um, usually they end up digressing or the person is an expert but isn't necessarily a great teacher. Um, this, I think he had a lot of help on it. I know he's, he enlisted some help with the recipes. And so there's 65 recipes in the back that are all meant to promote gut health, meaning a diverse am amount of plants and no animal foods in there. Um, but then they're all whole food, meaning that it's very little like processed foods to make them work. Um, it's just a great resource to have. So of any gut health book I've read, honestly, this is probably the top one. Uh, the superhuman organism would have been the top one prior to that. But this one coming with recipes and just even a little bit more current and a little bit less involved with the environment and more just like, that's how it relates to you. Like, I feel like that's how you get someone in the first one. Then they'll branch out from that. But anyone, like, like when you discuss, like, reasons to go vegan, you could say, like, for the environmental, for the animals, or for your health. Like, <laughs> that's what most people are like, oh, shit, this helps me? I'm in. And so um, this really is just, it's not about, like, what diet you follow, any of this. Like, if you're a human, this applies to you. And that that's kind of what I, I really am, like, drawn to in gut health is that it, there's no reason for it to be polarizing. There's no opposite end of it. Like where everyone is saying, you know, gut health is important. There's aren't people who are saying it actually isn't. There is no other end of the spectrum. We all know it is. So we're just starting to learn about it. And this is a great tool to begin that learning if you haven't already, or if you're already in it to take that further. Okay. So now diving into the like more topical books, I will say, um, even though this one was I don't know if we'd call it fiction, sort of like memoir-ish, like nonfiction, fiction, maybe fictionalized real stories, but um, Frying Plantain by Zalika Reed Benta, and it, it went by in a flash, I will say. It's basically like maybe 20 short stories in here, or 10 short stories, and all just about kind of like adolescence and coming up being what, what I would just call other. Like that's, that's the term that's kind of coming around a lot just in all, all, everything I'm reading is just the otherness. And I think that this really displayed it specific to that adolescent era where it's like, Hey, I'm becoming my own person, but I'm definitely not like on my own in the world. Like that, that was very interesting to me because I think that time is always something that we look back towards like, you know, high school and college, like that kind of coming of age time. And as a white person, I look back on that in my life and that was confusing enough just being me. I can't imagine having to navigate race on top of that. Or then in her case, also being a female and 
what is generally considered a man's world. Um, it, it's it it just shows the the layer of struggle that others have had to deal with that is unbeknownst to us, but that we would still look at someone as maybe less educated. Like it it is, it's just staggering how much challenge and ability these that you know she has or, or anyone has that to to make it out of this and then you know think of like starting first day of college like oh we're all in the same place here it's like yeah but one of us has done it way more in life culturally interpersonally like and this just kind of highlighted that without it having to be in such a heavy way like it's not like you're reading you know Angela Davis or, or something, you know, real intense. It, it allows that education to flow without being so direct and in really beautiful writing as well. So um, I got this book from Lit on Fire and Jessica there said she actually met her, um, which is always neat. It kind of reminds you that, you know, like authors aren't like rock stars. Like there are people like us who had enough wherewithal to put together a book and release it out to the public and she did a great job, and it's it's a really really good read. Um, it's nice that in in these times where we all want to be learning, we all want to take in as much as we can, but we all know that there's burnout. And there's a certain point where it's like, okay, I'm taking as much as I can, or you know, I use reading as my time for relaxation. If that's super critical, hard learning, like I I might not do it as much. Where if you have stories like this that have education in them, but it's also done in a way that's a little bit um, not so abrasive, it allows for more education in total to come through. And so this was really good for that. Yeah. Um, next, getting into one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin. And this was maybe a book I should have looked into more before buying it. <laughs> um, the Devil Finds Work was this one. And it was an odd read because it's essentially a collection of like movie reviews. And so at first I was like, oh, this might not have been the best book to read right now. I don't know if I learned so much from it. But on second thought, I realized like this might be the best book. Because I think after like this amount of time in quarantine, we're all, we're all scraping the barrel on Netflix. You know, we've seen those, la those movies we wanted to check out. We checked them out. Now what? Like, so what I'm thinking of doing, and I'll be honest, have not done it yet, um, is going through it and watching some of these movies and then just reading like the essay that goes along with it to give it a lot more context. But it's hard to understand kind of like what movies were doing culturally at that time or like relationships like this actor being in it, this director doing this, like I'm so disconnected from that scene. You know, like I barely know what's happening in like 2020 movie scene, you know, if that even exists amid pand amidst pandemic. But like in this, it was, I think if I like say I had seen all those movies, and now I went to read this, I'd be like, wow, those are some insights. I, like, but because I didn't know the movie, it, it it gave me more information about like society at the time than that like specific film or actress or like expanding on their story because I didn't really have any story to build on yet. But um, this does give me just like a list of like classic movies to kind of check out and then know that there's a little bit, bit of James Baldwin narrative on top of it. It's really enticing. So... I would say if you're like, I've never read James Baldwin, this is probably not the one to start with. But if you're like, hey, I like his voice and I like movies, check this out and this can help you find more movies to like. So um, still worthwhile to read. Um, it had an incredible quote in it. Um, and it would be a long time before I would cry and a longer time than that before I would cry in someone's arms. So even in movie reviews, James Baldwin is just gorgeous. Oh my God. So yeah, there's never going to be, I can't imagine I'm ever going to read a James Baldwin be on here, but like, it's not good. Like he, he is consistently amazing. Um, all right, moving on to the next one. This was probably one of the densest with information, um, but I don't know. It wasn't as upsetting as you might think it would be like there were there were points where it was upsetting and I'll get to the last book of the month was very upsetting to read and that's I'm this was information packed but I was able to get through it um without 
feeling so much so I could stay a little bit more like clear headed, I would say, while reading it. Um, but why all the black kids sitting together at the cafeteria, in the cafeteria, um, Beverly, Daniel, Tatum, this actually came out about 20 years ago. And this is just like a 20th anniversary edition. So there was like a 70 page essay in the beginning that has been added since and has a lot related to kind of everything that's happening now. Um, hasn't gotten that much better in 20 years, actually, especially the last four years, probably a little nosedive here on civil, civil rights. But this book was incredible. Um, it really wasn't political at all, which is very difficult to do with these sorts of, of books. But honestly, like, it just kind of laid out what was happening or what has been happening, but honestly felt very similar to the last section of Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon, um, where it was more about like the psychology of the oppressed and or the colonized in, in Fanon's circumstance. Um, but so basically just kind of looking at kids and how their psychology changes as they become aware of race or what their race means for them in the world. Um, so like an example would be, you know, very young age, all kids playing together, races doesn't matter, they're just they're playing, it doesn't, nothing factors in. And then later on, they segregate on their own. And it's, it's not because of disdain or hate or any any of the reasons that you may see in adults it's a, a camaraderie between someone who has experienced the same thing as you and the quote that I really liked in it here um because I don't know it's something I don't think I don't know how we ever get over it I, I don't know how we ever get over the issue of the world being a white world and I hate it. And it's, you, there's no way to stop its genesis. And I just don't understand what to do about it. And, but learning more about it has been helpful. But I guess just dismantling that idea that at a certain point, a, a kid of color will realize this isn't his world. That's just so tragic, but I, I don't know what to do around it. And so I think some of it is just white people acknowledging like, this isn't our world. Like, we talk about majority minority like it it everyone grows up feeling other to whites and a quote in the book that really got it for me was kind of in relation to the title of why are all the black kids sitting together at the cafeteria table you know why why would that happen teachers aren't telling them to do that it's, it's like i said it's that camaraderie but so the quote goes joining without joining with one's peers for support in the face of stress is a positive coping strategy what is problematic is that the young people are operating with a very limited definition of what it means to be black based largely on cultural stereotypes. So it's not that they learned culture, they learned where they come from or, or heritage or things. They learned that they aren't white and that's what defines them rather than the beauty of their own blackness. And that, that I think can be changed through education and, you know, we look at something like the Tulsa Massacre. Most people didn't know about that until you I learned about it from Watchmen. I'm not too proudful to hide that. You know, like, that. that's... It's a shame. A lot of people learned about Juneteenth this year. Because that culture is really hidden. And it's, it's horrible. But that, that lack of education and the suppression of education is what hinders progress and so by educating ourselves and then also understanding what the current education system does helps us to rectify it in our daily lives as much as possible and so I think it also allows you to kind of see where people are coming from a little bit better and it's not that I think my hands are going to change anything in the education system where this book was really focused on and, and kind of that early, early development, but you just realized what we made it out of, what, what we came from and that institutionally we are programmed in a certain way. And so when you say institutional racism, a lot of it goes to adults, 
you know, prisons and, and, and redlining and housing, but like from the jump, they, the, the psychology, not just of, oh, there are people who hate us, but that you are the other. And that, that may not even be seen as racism because it may not seem hateful or that, you know, one person is really perpetrating it, but that systemic, this land is our land and you're a guest or we don't even want you here, that's still being put out in our schools and understanding that is important. All right, so on to one of the best fiction books I've maybe read all year. Um, and it actually just came out in June 2020, which I was really glad to be getting some stuff that's so current. The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. Um, if you have seen this cover out about a bunch, like it's with good reason. This book is getting very popular very fast, and it covers a lot of ground culturally. Um, the title has a lot of meanings, and that is something that like really floored me because as much as I I would like to say like I commend no expectations, blank slate, you know, like expectations are still there, and at a certain point. The book is in, I think, five parts, and one part in, and I was like, oh, okay, and I, and now I understand, like, that, the title, all the, and then the second part, oh, so it, has, there's others, and then, oh, like, and it, it was a very grand and thought-provoking story weaved together between multiple perspectives, and I, I just, loved it <laughs> honestly yeah I, I i bought this book for my sister for her uh birthday i will definitely be recommending it loaning it out um she has another book the mothers was her first book definitely gonna be checking that out um just an incredible novel like and that's like what i was saying with um frank lantain i think you need to have some fictionalized education amidst everything if I was just straight up just Franz Fan and Angela Davis I would just be going nuts <laughs> and so like but I also don't necessarily just want to take a, a book and just read goofy stuff at this moment I'll be back to reading Tom Robbins and Kurt Vonnegut very soon but right now I have other types of learning I want to have happen and so this this really hit on a lot of stuff from race to to gender to class um I'm, I, I never want to give books away, and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing my best to not say anything about it, but still talk about it. <laughs> what, what I will say is that um, it reminded me of a book I really enjoyed from earlier in the year, um, The Gypsy Moth Summer. Um, so this book was kind of like dealt with race and class a little bit, kind of secluded island, uh, African-American couple moves on. It kind of causes a stir a little bit. There's also some other just weird stuff happening on the island, which is wonderful. But this just reminds me of that, of these like sort of closed societies and how much like one person can bucket. And th this book did a really good job of that. But then also just like, like how a lot of things are, you know, a couple different vantage points, one story all comes together. But like this really, um, I don't know, it really gave depth to a lot of issues that I think need humanized to be discussed fairly. And so when we look at trans issues, if we've never met anyone who's trans, never really thought, never bothered anyone, the law, the bathroom stuff, we never had anyone care about that stuff, and then we go to talk about it, we're probably going to be pretty careless with our, our opinions. And so I think for some people... You might live another 10 years and never meet a trans person. If you're in a, a real close society, you know, older people or something, but like reading about it, realize what that would be like going through. Like, you, just like with Frank Pantain again, like adolescence is hard enough. Imagine dealing with that. Like, imagine just feeling like you're in the wrong body or that you were born off and that you, you've got a big change to make. Like, it really really was an insightful read and I yeah I'm, I'm really glad she had that tenant in there along with the race along with the class and it just really brought a good picture of the inequities in our society today 
without being so harsh or finger pointy. Um, because they are universal. It's not just someone else is perpetrating them and I'm on the good side always. It's I'm, we're always learning what we've done and what we can do. So this was just a really good read. It, it, it didn't leave me feeling worn out from the educate. It didn't make me feel like just, well, there's white guilt through the roof, job done. Like that's not necessarily what like a book about race is supposed to do in my opinion. I, I, I think it's important to feel that we should be doing more but the level of guilt something incites isn't necessarily its rating system for how important it is. Um, and this does a really good job of being able to like be in that without being so distracted by thoughts like that. Um, yeah, just an incredible emotional read. And I, I, I will probably read that book again. And that's pretty rare for books on me, honestly. And I... I might listen to it. I'm starting again. To, I want to do like audiobooks in the kitchen of books I've read before. But um, yeah, incredible book. Um, so the next one I was real excited to dig into because like a lot of people, I there are a lot of parts of our political society that I, I'm ready to tear down, ready to, ready, to be do, ready to do away with. But I don't really know what comes next, honestly. And so I read The Socialist Manifesto as a means of starting to learn like what could be next, what has worked, what has not worked in other places. And what I will tell you is that this book is not a great um, advertisement for socialism. Now, the last, if I just read the last quarter of it, it's super insightful, good, that's got me fired up. But it just goes over the history of it and no one's done it well. So like, it's kind of disheartening to just read story after story of like, this society did it a couple years, and then it went so bad. Like, great. Anything else? Like, you know, so the, it, I, I learned some about socialism, um, which was basically my goal. I wasn't trying to, like, figure out, like, what do we do now? Like, I just, I just want to learn other things besides capitalism. And so I did learn some tenets of it. it I knew very little going in. I... I realize it, and I think a lot of people are that way on socialism. We we have feelings about it, but not necessarily like concrete understandings. And so, even just like the difference between socialism and communism, you know, like I, if I'm gonna be able to you know denounce capitalism or or be pro social, like I gotta be able to understand all the nuances here, to some degree. And so this was helpful in that. Um, and I think it's something that we all should be taking the time to learn. Not necessarily I'm suggesting this book, but, um, which is, is a good book, but um, I, it's something that affects all of us, the, the political system that our country uses. And so to just swear off of one because our parents went through the Red Scare and we were told that it's bad and our history books said it's bad, it's all communism, so it's all just bad. Like, it's not really giving it a fair shake, you know? Um, I look at like diet, you know, I, I gave 23 years to the standard American diet. I, I knew it inside and out. And then I tried the plant-based thing. If I had only ever been vegan and never tried it, I wouldn't have as much grounding to stand on to say like, that doesn't work well. Um, and so we've given a lot of time to understand capitalism. Let's, let's let ourselves learn the other, other options. And just my perspective on where we're heading, it's gonna be a fusion. It's gonna be democratic socialism, rolled into very slowly. It's not like we're gonna be like, you know what, let's be communist. Like that, never gonna happen. And so it's gonna be a gradual thing, but I think what needs to be shown are the, the things that can work. And this what this book really shows is that like, this is the stuff that hasn't worked. Like, yeah, when you get into the lack of private ownership and things like that, full communism, like you, there's so many steps to get there. If we just start looking at Marxism we're just going to be like, yeah, this is bizarre. I don't, I don't want that. I want to own stuff. Like you have to see how we got to that point. And so this does do a good job of showing the potential evolution. Um, but yeah, I would, I would loan it with caution. <laughs> um, so the next book, no surprise, very insightful. Angela Davis, um, women, race and class. This book was more radical than I thought it was going to be, which I loved. Um, 
for some reason, you, if you think back to, you know, reading something political from 40, 50 years ago, like, that it just wouldn't be as, as like, at the forefront as something is now, but not the case. She really was pushing it back then. Um, even just, like, just from, in, in the, the political systems to how outlook of race, sex, like, everything, I mean, just the... She's just brilliant. Like I, like I, I, there. Let me get the the quote that I liked from her. But yeah, she. This was not her first go around, and you could just tell. Like she is in this language. I feel like you could just like put a recorder in front of her, and she could just talk for four hours, and then put out a book, keep talking, another book, another book, and they would all be gold. Like <laughs> that's how. Just I was pausing with this book a lot, where I'm just like reading, just like, whoa. <laughs> um so yeah um this is in relation to family structures after slavery within them and just kind of like the roles that that made for men and women and how the system of slavery disabled men to really fulfill the roles that they generally would um Men were unable to cultivate for provider roles from family because all men, women, and children were providers for slaveholders. And that, it just, it kind of goes back to what I was saying on, like, the, um, like, the last part of Franz Fanon or, or um, uh, Beverly Tatum's book, the psychology of what was being done through that oppression. Not only could you not be independent and live with your family the way that you would want to and raise your kid the way you would want to, you're not able to be the provider in that. You're not able to, to make your home full. Like, you just, you could never be whole. And that, I, I just, it would take generations to get through that. Like, because, all right, say... At that moment, that person, man who can't provide, now you're free. Okay. You, the son is now going to be raised by a father who lived in that oppression. And so when we think about like even like someone like my parents grew up from raised by parents who are much more hardened. And if you go one generation past, much more hardened. And so we look at how long that takes to trickle back down that's where like when we look at you know like everyone has the same opportunities right now it's like no it's not the same like because we have generational trauma and some are dealing with it harsher in, in more grave ways than others so this was really insightful to that in it's just in it's just wild to me that she could be vocalizing Things that could be literally just said word for word today and no one would think that that came from 1981. Like, I think that's when this book was written. But, um, yeah, just a nonstop prolific voice. I think in trying to get some friends who were on the I'm not voting wave to vote, um, when Angela Davis put out her long thing of why she's voting, even though she doesn't approve of Joe Biden or the Democratic Party, I've had some friends say, all right, that clicked. It's like, yeah. The thing that was going around, it's like, Angela Davis is voting for Biden. Like, what do you know that she doesn't know? And I, that just, I love it. Um, so yeah, anything by Angela Davis is going to be incredible. Um, Are Prisons Obsolete is the next one I want to read. I have just like a lot of books that are getting sold out like crazy these days. And so I saw that one around and scooped it up. All right. Finished the month with a, the book I took more notes on than any book I've read in the last, I don't know how long, probably a year. Um, Rise of the Warrior Cop by Radley Balco. I saw him on Bill Maher, I think, um, talking. And honestly, wasn't a guy where I was like, I want to read more from him. But I was like, there's just not a lot of people that are giving an honest perspective on this. And that he wasn't full anti-cop only, like... I want to see a level-headed view of the, you know, like, it, it's, I, I have my opinions, but I also came into this, you know, before George Floyd, I hated police. So, I know I'm, I'm biased. Um, he basically details, where did our police forces come from? 
you know, because we didn't, we didn't come across on the Mayflower with a police force. So at some point they started and America being a very young country modeled ours after England. And it kind of just shows the evolution from there. And it, it dispelled some things that have been going around now online that I, it gives me a little bit more context and allows me to not share information that's maybe less than accurate. Um, which is helpful in these such like getting upset time where I see something, I'm just share that, share that. It's like, hold up, hold up, you know? So, um, it, it basically just articulated the rise, like the book says of how we went from cops walking around on a beat, just neighborhood guys that I, I still think of as like milkman, you know, like where it'd be someone you would know in the neighborhood goes back to cops patrolling the neighborhood they live in, but another topic, but to where they are now of wannabe SWAT, you know, gleaning as much from the military aside from discipline that, that they can. And it's pretty clear how things happened and why they happened the way they did. And it's not all, pure racism i will say it there i mean that's a bit that's a big part of it but um i think if we're going to talk about defunding the police about abolishing the police we have to be very specific about why and how we're we're going to do that and to just say it's because they're racist that's not enough you you we have to validate this further and so this book helped to give me a lot of information about where we come from so like something that i've seen going around a lot is that like all all police came from slave patrols that's all it is like well he, he articulates in the book that basically america splintered into three regions you had the the north the south and then the west and the south was slave patrols that's all it was was to look at night maybe a freed slave maybe someone who got out and their police force developed from that the North had night watch patrols, which basically just looked for drunk people and just, just unruliness and, and maybe some bigger crimes, but basically just like, hey, if you're doing crazy shit, we're, someone's around. But in the West was vigilantes, just exactly what it sounds like. And so um, that's why I do believe that the South is, is still just a different animal. <laughs> it, it, it just the, the history there... You cannot get away from it. But when ours had, when certain regions have a different history, even 200 years later, both doing something that's supposed to be so similar like policing, it's, it's skewed. It's different. It can't not be. And so it, it was very interesting to learn all, all of this and just sort of where we come from and really that, you know, a big change went from when cops were, were walking a beat to where they would only be in their car. Aside from just the lack of physical exercise and cops, you know, physical stature deteriorating over the last years, it just creates a very us versus them. You know, we're out here to get you. Like, and you, and we're, we stay protected, stay in the all black. We're not wearing a blue with a little badge and, and the, the hat. Like, it's war gear. It's SWAT gear. It's meant to, meant to look badass. And it creates a really messed up mentality. So when you look at something like no-knock raids being allowed, and then not just being allowed, but becoming the mainstay, you see that cops are just getting to do what they want to do. And it's not for the greater good. You know, one, one season cop was really explaining, you know, when you do a no-knock warrant and you throw in a flashbang grenade, you traumatize everyone in the house. And then you proceed and it's, but a no knock warrant might not be the best way to actually apprehend this, this criminal or this accused person. So when you think of staking someone out, getting to kind of know their habits, where they drive and stuff, you can know their usual route, pull them over on a traffic stop and arrest them then. That's the safest way, but that's not the funnest way. And that's the problem that we're dealing with is that a raid is exhilarating and getting to use all that gear justifies being able to buy more gear and that this spiral is what is sending our police policing to a point where it's beyond reform 
and there are people within the police department who have been in it for years that acknowledge this, that say that it's, it's gone too far. And I love the concept of abolishing the police just as someone who has had a lot of bad interactions with police and just see, see them beating the hell out of people and having no recourse. After a while, it's just, this is garbage, get rid of them. But this gives me much more solid framework to understand why this entity should be dissolved. Yes, other social services will come up. Certain things may resemble or carry out services similar to police, but they aren't necessary. It's not just abolish as a symbol and then rebuild the same thing. It's not that. The training right now, from from the training to the culture within it to the the stuff that they get to do outside of the the force, like extra training for guns and, and tactics that just heighten this f- fetish for military, it it just creates a breed of people that are just going to go out and hurt. And it's it's just so clear that. They were talking about before a uh, Democratic National Convention, this group of cops got shirts made that said, we wake up early to beat the crowds. And it's just like, that's the type of stuff they think is cool. There's no like, let's make some tweaks to that. Like, it's done. That's, that's terrible. And so I, I would like to see this book get out there more not just because it it explains the problem with police, but because it's not anti-police, but because it's so honest and really shows both sides. There's some parts where there, you know, there's a lot of stories about raids in the book. And so there's certain parts where we'll go through and we'll say, at this point, the cops haven't technically done anything wrong. And I would, I would agree. So, you know, yeah, like that, that person fired, now they're resp- like, okay, ho- you know, so it really is a very close analysis of what is specifically wrong, what is right. Now, those things get real blurry sometimes and things happen fast, but being able to go through so many raid stories and so many perspectives after things have happened really show that just the way we're going about apprehending criminals and the way that the drug war is promoted to generate more criminals, which is just for prison labor, isn't keeping us safer. And if our mental health is deteriorating nationally, our crime is going up, our addiction is going up, then this increase we've had in policing doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to be calculated, doesn't seem to be working out. So we have so many years of data now. We can, we can act accordingly. And this book rolls together a lot of that data. Well, those eight books made for quite a month. Um, I am just about one book in already on this month. Um, it's about mushrooms. And really got some good ones on deck. Um, thank you for anyone who's watching this stuff. This is episode four. If you've watched all four of these, leave a comment. Seriously, let me know. High five to you. Like, I'm really excited about doing these and look forward to doing more. Um, and just really appreciate any support you're offering up. So if you have any questions, anything, send me a message. Big love to you.